Good morning. Today's call to worship is excerpts from Maya Angelou's On the Pulse of Morning, found in celebrations, rituals of peace and prayer. Please join me as you wish. Lift up your faces. You have a piercing need for this bright morning dawning for you. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, and if faced, need not be lived again. 
Lift up your eyes upon the day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Take it into the palms of your hands. Mold it into the shape of your most private need. Sculpt it into the image of your most public self. Lift up your hearts. Each new hour holds new chances for new beginnings. Do not be wedded forever to fear, yoked eternally to brutishness. The horizon leans forward, offering you space to place new steps of change here on the pulse of this fine day. You may have the courage to look out and up upon me. The rock, the river, the tree, your country. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sibling's eyes, into your sibling's face, your country, and say simply, very simply, with hope, good morning. Now, what I want to talk about is the fact that um, the congregation makes all the decisions of our life, and we appoint and we had appointed a committee of people to look into securing a new pastor for us. Now, that was very important because one of the jobs of the committee is to be very thorough and to be very careful about selection. And therefore, it's really important to emphasize that all those people in that committee that called John Jeter, was, they were top people. They were very qualified and very sensitive good people. What they discovered is that, their, that John's resume kept coming up to the top. They had several candidates, but his kept coming to the top. And they were reluctant because he was young, just coming out of seminary, and yet he had all the qualities and, and the poise of someone who would seem to fit our bill. Well, they decided to do that. They did have some reservations about John. Was he gay? Was there some question about that being a question that would, others would raise, and they said, well, we have no right to ask. That we, our job is not to be in somebody's bedroom. That's not our job. If we ask one person, we have to ask everybody that. And so they said, no, no, we're good. Well, John and I had a conversation, and he had not told the committee that he was gay. And he asked me, should I tell them? I said, yes. You tell the committee at least. Let them decide what they wanted to do with that. So he told them. And they decided not to put that in front of the committee uh, of the church, that is to say, for the vote. But they all knew that, but the congregation did not. Came the time for voting. John was rather highly voted in. I mean, well, the votes were very strong in his favor. So come time for his installation, however, um, he had put in a program, uh, one of the speakers being beloved friend. Now, there are people in the congregation who were printers and they saw that and that raised red flags for them. They said, what does this mean? You know, he's asking his beloved to be part of the service. Is he gay? And so it did come out finally with this family because their son was on the search committee um, that John was gay and that in fact um, this beloved friend of his was going to be part of the service. And they went crazy. They, among other things, stirred up all kinds of people who thought that but they would be supporting them in their opposition to John. They called me and said, you know, as a clergy, you have the obligation to clear this up. You know, we can't have a gay person in our pastor, in our pulpit. And that's just totally wrong. I said, no, I don't think so. That's not going to happen. The biblical mandate is clear. We don't have that kind of prerogative to be with any candidate. Well, then they decided to stir the pot so deeply that John decided that he wanted a vote of confidence. So we said, yes, of course. So we set about the date to put a vote of confidence in place. And uh, then several of us put our heads together about strategizing what that would look like. It was clear there was a division in the House, a very deep division in the House in that process. 
And we said, well, you know, if we're going to have a vote of confidence, we need to be prepared. And we met uh, at the Mouse household. And Karen and Hank were absolutely fantastic in helping support that process. That is to say that both sides would get a chance to talk. We choreographed it very nicely. Joe Washburn was the, uh, the moderator of the church, and he was very skilled at putting meetings together. He'd been in lots of them himself. So we had really good leadership doing the jobs that needed to be done, both in the committee and subsequently in the congregation as we moved into a vote. I remember one of the dynamics of that vote was certain people got up and spoke very passionately about their opposition and how it was scripturally based and you know, how wrong it was and who was going to come in here and tell us that this was totally wrong. There were certain people in our denomination, in the church, who surely would come in and help rescue us from this horrible dynamic. Well, that became quite an issue later on, and we had to answer that. Of course, the answer was, of course, nobody's going to tell us what to do. We are part of the group, the contingency that makes that decision. That's an organic process, right? We have obligations of our own to see to it that that position is clearly stated and that you have the information you need to make a decision as a congregation. And I remember I was at the podium and they were asking, well, where is the leadership going to come from this? And I said, listen, look around this room. That's where the leadership is going to come. We are the leaders that's going to get we're, we're, in this congregation. We're going to be making the decision. We did take the vote, and John was affirmed in that process. And as a result, there was a lot of division in the congregation. Um, people had to choose sides about where they were going to land by way of membership. Some left. Families were, families were divided. There was lots of acrimony, and we wondered if we were going to be decimated in that process because it was so contentious. But I think the crucial thing was we were people who stood by our convictions. We were strong in that. We knew that we were making the right decisions for us as a community of faith here in this congregation, that we had been called at this moment to stand up for what we believe is right. I remember in one of those uh, sessions, um, Stu Huggard had to make an, an affirmative comment. Later he told me that he'd been a member of this church for years. It was the first time he'd ever been asked to stand up for anything. And uh, that really made an impression on me. I think it's true that we don't often get to those places in our life where we have to declare ourselves and say clearly, this is where I stand. I don't know, there's a certain quality about uh, being grounded in the faith that gives one the capacity to stand in the middle of the whirlwind and be grounded. Know that, okay, there's acrimony, but this too will pass and we'll get beyond this. We really didn't know how much of an impact it was going to have but over time, it became clear that some of those who'd spoken, even in John's favor, left the congregation. Uh, I don't know the numbers, but it was, you know, in, in the range of 20 or 30 people, maybe, uh, that uh, did leave, and we wondered, you know, mm, what would become of the congregation? We said, we don't know. We're going to have to live into the future and, you know, be clear about our stance and be unapologetic about what we've done here because we had great confidence and faith in what we had done. Uh, there was no, nobody telling us that oh, this is what you've got to have, this is what you have to do. We had the experience of being people who mm, took on hard issues and could talk about that. I think that was really pretty crucial. Um, and we stayed in that mode uh, for a long time to sort it out, to see what would happen. And we're still living with that. I think there is a certain sense in which um, some of those families were never reconciled to this stand of it being an open and affirming congregation. Um, and, you know, that's the way it is, isn't it? I mean, we don't expect a mass movement. If you're standing up for something that's mm, really crucial and really decisive, 
you're expecting conflict and difficult times. And so you need to be prepared for that. Prepare, as we say, prepare your guts for the hard decision ahead. Well, I'll tell you, we were the first and only congregation on Long Island to have an open and affirming stance and have an open gay pastor. So it was a statement, not just to this congregation, but to the community and to Long Island and the denomination. So we knew that that impact was going to have some consequences. There were people who called and were very hostile to John. Even some of the clergy in town, when John went to a meeting of clergy, there were clergy in that gathering who would not shake his hands. There were other clergy who told me they couldn't be in the room with, with a gay person like that because it was against their religion or whatever. These were clergy that were talking to me. So I think that was one of the impacts. So people in town, they were surprised, and they said, well, you're going to be forever known as the gay church. And we said, oh, well, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, what it, that's what it is. That's what we'll be. Uh, but we don't think that's the case. And well, let's see. Let's grow into this place. We don't really know what's going to happen. And um, so I think the community took note. And as they take note even now, when we have a rainbow flag out there, you know, people, some people do not like that. He do not like to believe that the others, those that are different than they are, are equally God's beloved and hmm, deserve a place in a community and in our hearts. Oh, yes. So... That's a very powerful statement, even today. Hush, hush, the Spirit's calling my name. Hush, hush, can you the same. Hush, hush, the Spirit's calling my name. Hush, hush, burning like a flame. I can feel it, the power of God. Oh, hush, hush, the Spirit's calling my name. the Spirit gives, given to bless one and all. Inside of each one the Spirit lives, helping us follow the call. Oh, hush, hush, the Spirit's calling my name. Hush, hush, can you hear the same. Hush, hush, the Spirit's calling my name. Hush, hush, burning like a flame. I can feel it, the power of God. Oh, hush, hush, the Spirit's calling my name. Hush, hush, the Spirit's calling my name. Pour out your spirit, O oh breath of God. Breathe in your people today. Strengthen your church in the world abroad. Lead us in Jesus' way. Oh, hush, hush, the Spirit's calling my name. us 
us to live every day. Help us to live in the ways above. Give us your power as we pray. Oh, hush, hush, the Spirit's calling my name. Hush, hush, can you hear it the same? Hush, hush, the Spirit's calling my name. Hush, hush, burning like a flame. I can feel it, the power of God. Oh, hush, hush, the Spirit's calling my name. Hush, hush, the Spirit's calling my name. Please join me in the unison prayer, continuing with excerpts from Maya Angelou's Celebrations, Rituals of Peace, and Prayer from a Brave and Startling Heart. Dedicated to the hope for peace, which lies sometimes hidden in every heart. We, this people on a small and lonely planet, traveling through casual space, past aloof stars, across the way of indifferent suns, to a destination where all signs tell us it is possible and imperative that we learn a brave and startling truth. And when we come to it, to the day of peacemaking, when we release our fingers from fists of hostility, when we come to it, when the curtain falls on the minstrel show of hate, when we come to it, we, this people on this wayward floating body created on this earth, of this earth, have the power to fashion for this earth a climate where every person can freely live without sanctimonious piety, without crippling fear. When we come to it, we must confess that we are the possible. We are the miraculous. We are the true wonder of this world. That is when, and only when, we come to it. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for those who shall have borne the battle, and for those left behind, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. With this piece from Lincoln's second inaugural address in mind, and with these words of Jesus to the disciples, I give you peace, my peace I give you, let us offer one another a sign of peace this day and all days that reaches deep into our human spirit and longing and the peace that has existed long before this planet found its way into the universe. May this peace, the peace of the risen Christ, be with you. tide forever flowing by the throne of God. Yes, we'll gather by the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the sand by the river that flows by the throne of God. Our first reading today is an excerpt from Invisible Man, written by Ralph Ellison, 1945. Chapter 1. It goes a long way back, some 20 years. All my life I'd been looking for something, and everywhere I turned, 
someone tried to tell me what it was. I accepted their answers too, though they were often in contradiction and even self-contradictory. I was naive. I was looking for myself and asking everyone except myself questions which I, and only I, could answer. It took me a long time and much painful boomeranging of my expectations to achieve a realization everyone else appears to have been born with, that I am nobody but myself. But first, I had to discover that I am an invisible man. And yet, I am no freak of nature, nor of history. I was in the cards, other things having been equal or unequal 85 years ago. I'm not ashamed of my grandparents for having been slaves. I'm only ashamed of myself for having at one time been ashamed. About 85 years ago, they were told that they were free, united with others of our country in everything pertaining to the common good and in everything social, separate like the fingers of the hand. And they believed it. They exulted in it. They stayed in their place, worked hard, and brought up my father to do the same. But my grandfather is the one. He was an odd old guy, my grandfather, and I'm told I take after him. It was he who caused the trouble. On his deathbed, he called my father to him and said, son, after I'm gone, I want you to keep up the good fight. I never told you, but our life is a war. Live with your head in the lion's mouth. I want you to overcome them with yeses, undermine them with grins, agree them to death and destruction. Let them swallow you till they vomit or bust wide open. They thought the old man had gone out of his mind. He had been the meekest of men. The younger children were rushed from the room, the shades drawn, and the flame of the lamp turned so low that it sputtered on the wick like the old man's breathing. Learn it to the young'uns, he whispered fiercely. Then he died. The shining river. Soon our pilgrimage will cease. Soon our happy hearts will quiver with a melody of peace. will gather by the river the beautiful the beautiful river gather with the saints by the river that flows by the throne of God that flows by the Our second reading from today's lectionary, Psalm 100. From Psalms for Praying, An Invitation to Wholeness by Nan C. Merrill. Sing a joyful noise to the beloved, all peoples of earth. Serve love with a glad heart. Join hands in the great dance of life. Know that the beloved of your heart is the divine presence. Love created us and we belong to the Most High. We are born to be loving, expressions of the Creator's divine plan. Open the gates of your heart with gratitude and enter love's court with praise. Give thanks to the beloved, bless love's holy name. For love is of God and lives in your heart forever. With faith, truth, and joy, now and in all that is to come, alleluia, Amen.
On October 27, 1990, Stu Hergard wrote this letter to the congregation. Dear friends, in the 20 years I have been part of this church, I have listened to many messages from the Bible, from the pulpit, and from each other. The overriding message has been a message of love. It is a simple message, but that does not mean that it's an easy one. God's love, human love, caring for each other, have been themes that have resounded through this church from the pulpit, from the choir, and from the congregation. There were no qualifications put on that love. In Emmanuel, as Joseph, I sang, Dear little child of ours, what can I promise you? And my promise was, I'll be there. I'll be there to help you be the best person you can be, regardless of your race, religious beliefs, color of your skin, or sexual orientation. After 50 years within a Christian community, I have now been asked to stand up for what I believe. I believe God loves all and that God's love is meant to expand our lives, not limit them. I support United Church of Christ as an open and affirming church. I support our search committee for doing an excellent job based on the informational meetings that were held. I support John in his response to God's call to work with us in Saveville. With love, Stu Hargard. Stu and Suzanne currently live in Florida, and he forwarded this letter to me as part of our share pride for this month of remembering pride. June month is pride month. And I wanted to share it with you, and I will have it on the website as well. If you are new to our worship service or not familiar with Stu and Suzanne Huggard, they currently live in Florida and have been long-term members of this congregation. They were here during the time that John Jeter, a talented, gifted, and called minister who happened to be gay, required many people to stand up and say what they believed. The impact of the decision to call John and install John has had far-reaching impact in our congregation, the community of Sayville, and our denomination and others as a whole. will always be built and founded on this kind of love, the one that expands and emancipates us, not constricts and constrains us. Whenever the latter has captured us for a while, whenever we have felt constrained or contained, God's love always wins, even if the break from the holes of despair are resurrection-like, requiring a transformation following a period of great pain. God's love is more than just a happy dance. It is life-giving even when the music seems to have stopped, when the silence has deafened us and the screams have deafened us, and tear gas and noisemakers have deafened us with their arsenals and their words, stunned us with their callousness and disregard for life and health of others. God's love brushes all that aside and says, I'll be there. I am with you. You are not alone. Come, follow me, even now, especially now. Let others know me by how you know me with the love I have given you to share. These past few months have been an opportunity, I think, again, to stand up for what we believe in. And the opportunity continues to bring God's love to the table with every meal, to the streets, with every conversation, to the legislative bodies of our country, and to the mourners as loved ones 
are put to rest. Those leaving their legacy now in our hands, these hands made of love. It has always been this way. The God-given power of love is what has brought us through everything. And this month, there's so much going on. This coming week, we remember June 19th, 1865. Two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation had been signed, on that day, Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas, with orders that the slaves were free, making it the last Confederate state to receive those orders under the directive of the Emancipation Proclamation. Love won that day. That day now remembered as Juneteenth, Jubilation Day and Celebrations Day. And the remembrances began in church-centered community groups in Texas following that directive. You may have heard this week about the Tulsa Race Massacre in relation to the celebration of Juneteenth Day in that city. The Tulsa Race Massacre. God's love won out over those who would again constrict and contain others, even in that massacre. But not until after, as some have called it, the single worst incident of race violence in this nation took place in that city of Tulsa. The Tulsa riots, also known as the Greenwood Massacre and the Black Wall Street Massacre occurred from May 31st to June 1st, 1921. On those days, mobs of white residents attacked black residents, their businesses, all throughout the Greenwood district of Tulsa. The attack carried out on the ground and from private aircraft destroyed more than 35 square blocks of that district. It was at the time the wealthiest black community in the United States. Hundreds were injured, dozens were killed, and God's love survived again. God's love led that community on, and that community became one of the dominant centers for Juneteenth to remember the liberation and the pain it takes. Freedom has a cost. It can never be surrendered, and God's love will always expand our lives no matter who may try to limit or contain them. There really is no way to contain God's love. Why even try? Embrace it. Run with it. Share it. Contain it. Foolhardy. Just ask Richard Perry Loving and Mildred Jeter Loving. God's love, in their case and in our case, was winning a unanimous decision over a deeply flawed attempt to make it unconstitutional for people of different races to intermarry, a unanimous Supreme Court decision in favor of racial justice. June 12th, 1967, referred to as Loving Day, the Supreme Court struck down any such laws that restricted interracial marriage, love and the lovings won. And we win whenever love does. It was a good day for us all, but June 12th hasn't always been such a good day. It was early in the morning of another June 12th, this one in 2016 when a gunman entered the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. A gay club that night filled with folks celebrating Latin night. 49 people were killed by the sole gunman who himself was later killed. <clears throat> Another 53 people were injured. In tragedies like the Tulsa Massacre, Pulse Nightclub, and so many more, especially when people are targeted for who they are or for being unwilling to change into who others want them to be, I always try to remember how even Broken hearts can still love, perhaps even more. And how those who died in such situations were surrounded by love. How love 
embraced them before the moment of their death and does even now. I always try to remember how such acts of division and dehumanization always create an outpouring of love and response. Just look for it. It's there. It doesn't change what happens. It just reminds us of the cost of being who we are, of standing up for what we believe in, and how we need to love a little more to make up for all those who don't. And how God's love is strong enough to do that, you know. It is God's love that makes it possible to go on, even if we may not refer to it as such. It is that something in us that makes it possible to go on, no matter how forever changed by these events we might be. Do you know we're getting close to 100 days since this pause that we're in and moving out of first began. It's been a month that has called us to reach out in ways greater than we ever imagined with love. And God's love has again been called upon to move us through this time of upheaval in a nation. What do I believe in? How do I stand for what I believe in? And we have been standing, haven't we? We've been standing against the killing of George Floyd, the murder that has unleashed the deep and unyielding wave for justice and love that has finally crested. There is no turning back this time. There is none. There's no way to diminish or deter God's love now moving us through another time of transformation, a resurrection-like transformation. The speed with which this is occurring the harmony that it will produce is dependent upon how much we embrace the only solution there is to such a moment, to this season, to this time under the sun. And it is now to love, to do what we need to do to carry and share and spread and speak love that is the solution and let no one divide, deter, distract, constrain, or attempt to contain us. Friends, love will win here too. Love always wins. And we're involved in making sure that's true. From the person you look at sitting across from you at home to the individual that serves you in a public place like a supermarket or a restaurant, and to the greater needs of this country and everything in between, to all those who have cared for us during this time, and for those that are going to need our care going forward, love will win here too. Yes, God's love is always meant to expand us and not limit us. And I think this too, that God cannot do what God needs to do without our help, without standing up for what we believe. That is how God has always won and how God will win now through us.
Let every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the roar. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has taught us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat have not our we Come to the place for which our fathers died. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path with the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloom. Now stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has brought thy might let us into the light keep us forever in the path we pray as our feet stray from the places our God where we meet thee as our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget We thank you for your support of Sable Congregational United Church of Christ and each other in these times we share. We appreciate your donations whenever you are able. Please know that you can mail these to our office. The mail is collected daily. Most of all, stay safe and let us know if there is any way we might help you or others you know of who would appreciate a touch of our hospitality.
When all the world is a hopeless jumble And the raindrops tumble all around Heaven opens a magic lane When all the clouds darken up the skyway, there's a rainbow highway to be found. Leading from your window pane to a place beyond the sun, just a step beyond the rain. upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me where troubles melt like lemon drops away up of the chimney tops that's where you'll find me Happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow. Why, oh, 